I really admire you for your ability to really uh, present a melody in a crystal clear way. And uh, I want to talk to you about that, how you, what your processes of getting to know a melody and then really living that melody and then transporting it to the listener or, and also your band members. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think I've always been interested in melody very much um, because I was brought up um, listening to the, you know, the great American songbook, um, Frank Sinatra. He was the main influence, the first singer that I heard that I absolutely loved. Mm. My parents loved him, which helped. So, yeah. you know, of course, as a child, I was focused on him. Um, we only had radio. So I would hear Frank Sinatra. My dad liked Fat Swallow very mm. much. Pianist Fat Swallow. But he loved pianists anyway, but they both loved Sinatra, and so did I. Of course, I just immediately soaked up these melodies and learnt them. Yeah. At this, I always wanted to learn things I heard. Mm. I would like want to sing them mm -hmm. immediately. And the more difficult they were, the more interested I was. <laughs> I don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I had a, a line that, was, uh, that I would hear in, in classical music even uh, that was difficult, I would want to learn it. How um, did you learn it then? Just by ear, just yeah. listen. And mm -hmm. I obviously had a fairly quick ear because I couldn't say when I would hear it again. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, sure. <laughs> you, know, you, never, you never know. You're, yeah, sure. Also, my mother knew a lot of standard songs. She used to sing just to herself, you know. Oh, nice. And so I would say to her if I heard a song, oh, I like that. Can you teach me that? And then she would sing it to me. And so I would learn it that way. And she'd sometimes get me the music of a piece if I liked it because I started to learn piano when I was about seven and a half, eight or something. And um, I can't tell you how I learned these things. I think I just listened a lot mm -hmm. and focused. I think it's a different way of listening, you know. Mm. You know you're trying to learn something and you can't go back to it immediately. Yeah. You listen in a more focused way. And I would get taken as well to see these like, musical films. Mm. And I, thought I was about eight, and my mother took me to see a, a piece, thing called Words and Music. And it was all music of Rogers and Hart. Oh, yeah. With different singers. And suddenly this singer called Lena Horn came on. Mm -hmm. The most beautiful woman you've ever seen, or mm. I'd ever seen. And uh, she sang The Ladies a Tramp. Mm -hmm. And I remember... I said to my mum, can you get me that music? I want to sing that song. And she did. So I learnt it from the music. Mm -hmm. uh, every Christmas, the family would have a party. I was, I was born in the East End of London, very, very um, underprivileged people there. Mm -hmm. But very, very uh, gregarious. And all the families would get together. Mm. And we did at Christmas. And we would all sing. And, you know, my dad would just play the piano. You know, not he couldn't he couldn't read. He just used to play whatever he could. You know? Yeah. And the children always used to have to do something. You know, do a little sure. song, dance, or something. Yeah. But that doesn't tell you how I learned. I can't. I honestly don't know mm -hmm. how I. I just think that because there were these restrictions, which of course you wouldn't have now. You know, now you can hear anything anytime. Sure. But then it wasn't like that. So if if you like something. Or if I, I like something, then I had to really focus on it and try. I don't know how I did it, but I would organize it in my mind. Mm. And those pieces, often the, the American songbook, they, they followed this pattern you know, of eight bars, eight bars. Sure, eight bars, yeah. To two bar form. So if you like the first one, you know you know the next one and probably the last one. Yeah. <laughs> you had to learn the bridge. Yeah. But I don't know. It was just always a love, a great love of melody. It wasn't only um, this popular music of the time. I loved lots of classical music, especially the um, Impressionist composers, Debussy mm -hmm. and Ravel. And of course, later, when I fell in love with Bill Evans playing, you know, yeah. he used all those harmonies. Mm -hmm. So it was something that was there, but basically in me from yeah. the beginning but how is it now um when you became uh, a professional musician mm. uh how did the process change for you or did it change for you when then you were presented with uh very difficult music at difficult. times uh, yeah um how did you then get acquainted with 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 everything that was presented to you 
<clears throat> well, I think because I learned piano, I could read music. So when I started to to be presented with music that I didn't, I never heard before, I could at least go to the piano and, and play it and mm -hmm. learn it, just read it that way. So that was that was very useful and helpful. I, I don't know otherwise how I would have managed. It would have been a much longer process. Yes. You know, having to get someone to play it to me and to listen and listen and learn. So it was very useful being able to at least play the melodies on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. And, and th then the, the, the learning process was longer, but still the same thing. I would listen and listen and uh, Sometimes there'll be very difficult intervals which don't immediately go into yeah. the air. Then I would find my own ways of uh, of recognizing and remembering when I came to that interval the next time. Um, but I can't say exactly how I did it. You know, I would I would look at something and I would think, oh, but there it goes up a tone, whereas the last time it went up a semitone, or and there it's a minor third if I can hear it, or a fifth, or you know, just as a help when yeah. my it didn't help, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did some quite difficult things when I was working with Michael Garrick, um, pianist, um, who really only played his own music. And uh, he asked me to join his band. And I, um, he had had two saxophones and trumpets front line. And one of the saxophonists left. And he just said, well, would you like to sing, take that chair and sing saxophone? Mm -hmm. Which was a big thrill for me because uh, I'd always wanted to do, since hearing Miles Davis, uh, Kind of Blue. Yeah. Now that made me think that I wanted to do something other than just sing a song. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to be part of a music. And um, I got that opportunity then with Michael. How did it feel? Oh, it was, it was great. Very difficult because sometimes, you know, because of the range of a saxophone and perhaps the range of the voice, I might be just a second away, you know, <laughs> rather than a seventh or a yeah. ninth from, from the other instrument. You know, I really had to focus hard on my note. Yeah. Um, and then find its place in the chord, you know, um, which happens after a while. You, you hear where it sits. Yeah. I'd, I'd sung in choirs at school, you know, I'd done choral singing. And also I did um, session work, you know, studio work. Mm -hmm. And I would often do vocal group things there, you know, we would be asked to, to do something. I was part of a, a vocal group. It, it, it didn't work. It didn't perform, but it recorded sometimes yeah. for BBC, you know, four men, four women. Mm -hmm. And I, was, I sang the lower of the women's lines. So that was interesting to me because it wasn't the melody, you know. Yeah. I was always interested in that, yeah. in singing something which affected the whole sound. Mm -hmm. And, of course, then when Kenny Wheeler asked me if I would like to do a broadcast with his band, um, big band, um, which he didn't, he didn't have a big band, but... If he was offered a broadcast, then he would get people together and he had the music, you know, uh, which he had written. He started, I think, writing for big band with um, John Dankworth uh, yeah. when he was in the John Dankworth band. And, and Kenny was ill. I think he had abscesses on his, you know, his gums. Mm -hmm. He couldn't play. So John Dankworth said, well, can you write something for the band? Oh, yeah. So not playing. And he wrote all the pieces for Windmill Tilter. Do you know that oh, album? <gasps> Do you know it? Such a beautiful record, yeah. I, I didn't know him then, but I remember I got the album and I played it to yeah. death. I just played it over and over. I just, yeah. Again, you see, Kenny always wrote melodies, mm. beautiful melodies. Yeah. Sometimes seem obscure, but beautiful. And, yeah. And all his improvising was melodic. Mm hmm. So it immediately appealed to me. Yeah. Um, what so, was your favorite song from that record? Oh, I don't know. Well, there's so many. I mean, there's a little sequence that I love um, between clarinet and trumpet. I think it's just Tony Coe mm. and I think Kenny. And they, they play, I, can't, I don't know what it was called now because I haven't played it for a long time. But there's so many places, I, you know, Sancho... Sancho Panza, um, Altisidora, I like very much. Mm. Da, 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 da. Kind of thinking is yeah, thinking of it as I'm hearing it. But 
I haven't played it for a long time, but at the time I played it all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't really have a favourite. To me, when we had the LPs, you know, vinyls, it was like a, a shape. Fav favourite side, maybe. Minutes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 20 minutes and then the other 20 minutes. Yeah. yeah. But, um, I really like uh, Sweet Dolce Nea Blue. Oh, know? it's a gorgeous song. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, the, and, the, and the second line as well. Yeah. Da -de -da -da, da -de -da -da. Yeah, right. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it's lovely. Mm. I think Eleven's recorded that. Did he? I think he did, yes. Wow, I, I'll, I'll check that out. Wow. Yeah. Were they acquainted? Like, uh, did they get to know each other when Bill Evans played in London? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Um, but uh, there was a pianist um, called Pat Smythe, a, yeah. a male pianist, and he knew Bill very well, I think. And he was a great fan of... Um, He's not on here, right? No, he? no, no. 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 But where did I read the name? Well, he played, oh, I don't know, Shirley Horn. One time when she was not playing, uh, not accompanying herself, I remember she would ask Pat Smythe to oh. accompany her. Wow. Yeah, he was a beautiful pianist and very interested. In it. I mean, he would sort of discover people. Like, I think he, he brought Alan Holdsworth, the guitarist, to London to play. You know, mm. Alan was up in the north of England and Pat somehow discovered him. I don't know how, but. Mm. suggested he come to London and um, oh. but anyway I think Pat Smythe probably introduced Bill to Dulcinea I'm not really sure about this but wow. I think that could have been how it happened now I want to hear it I, I have to check it out <laughs> Woo, okay mm. I really think that um, and maybe you can comment on that too uh, I have the feeling that a lot of Kenny's music your music and JT's music especially the harmony in pieces like Time Remembered mm. or Blue and Green, yeah. I think there are a lot of seeds for the music of, of you guys planted yeah. in, those, in those chords, in those harmonies. I'm sure. Um, yeah, do you think so too? Yes, I think so. Because when I first met John, um, I think he just discovered Bill Evans. He was just getting into mm. Bill Evans then. That's which year? Peterson. Um, About, I think I first met John in 1966. Mm -hmm. I was singing in a, a pub. There were lots of jazz pubs in, in London or pubs where they would have a trio and a singer mm. so many nights a week. And uh, I started off by going and asking if I could sing. Sing a with, tune, yeah. Yeah, sing a tune. And they reluctantly agreed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Often, yeah, <laughs> often after that, They would say, oh, well, in two weeks' time, you know, we, we need somebody on Friday or something. Mm -hmm. So that way I started to get some work. Yeah. And um, I was doing one of these things, and John Taylor had just come to London, and he came up in the interval and said, can I sit in? And he had a drummer friend with him. And I said, well, it's not up to me because it's not my gig. You know, you ask the group. And they said yes. And so he played. And afterwards he said to me, if you need a piano player, here's my number. But I didn't ever need a piano player because I used to do these gigs where the pianists were already there. Yeah. You know? But eventually we found ourselves working in the same place. And about well, six months later, I was doing a Friday night at this pub and John was doing five nights a week there. So mm. our nights crossed. And immediately we said, right. Let's rehearse something because nobody ever rehearsed for these gigs. Mm. You just went and played and sang. And I'd met John Stevens when he was just playing conventional jazz. I sat in at a place and he immediately went and tried to organize a, an audition for me at Ronnie Scott's. And uh, he did. He did organize it. But by the time the audition happened, John had discovered free music and didn't want to play <laughs> ordinary time so <laughs> I remember um, he'd organized for Gordon Beck um, who was a wonderful pianist and Je Jeff Klein great bass mm -hmm. player he'd organized for us to do this audition by the time the audition happened he was no longer playing a conventional time he wanted to do free music yeah so Gordon said to me oh don't worry don't worry I've got a drummer who's just come down from the north of England Tony Oxley ah. So, okay. So that was my audition trio. 
So you would audition for the 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 club owner for Ronnie yeah. for Ronnie Scott's? Yeah. Okay. And uh, anyway, so he gave me four weeks there, wow. which at the time they used to do a month each time each each artist uh, would do a month, and I was opposite Roland Kirk as he was mm. then in Rassar. Wow. But that was through John Stevens, really. But but John had then was was just playing free music. So he asked me if I would join in on some of the free things he was doing, which I did. And that's, I think, where I first really met Kenny. I see. Kent, Dave Holland was there at one time because Dave was in the same house as John Taylor. Mm. They hadn't known each other, but they both came to London and um, they'd both taken a room in this house. <laughs> which wasn't a musician's house. Mm. I remember Dave saying, we were talking, he said, and we discovered that I was really into Ray Brown and John was really into Oscar Peterson. Yeah, right. <laughs> they started to play together. And Dave would come in sometimes and sit in with me and John mm. at this pub. Anyway, so that was the scene. So I was doing free music, really, when I met Kenny. Mm. Then he asked me if I wanted to do something just to do a broadcast with his band. He said, I'll arrange a, a standard for you. And he did. He arranged, I'll never be the same, I think. Mm. Um, I thought that was the first broadcast. And then the next time I, I I did a broadcast with him, he'd written me in as part of the band. But Nick Smart, who's a, the head of, uh, of uh, jazz at the uh, Royal Academy of Music, who is also writing a book about Kenny. Oh, that's good uh, to know. Yeah, so he's been doing a lot of research into old recordings and and he says that I actually, the first broadcast I did with Kenny, I sang Don No More, mm -hmm. which I, I wrote some words for, mm. you know, from Windmill Tilter. Yeah. Which is a great piece, thinking about it again. But anyway, then he started to write me in as part of the band, which was a bit of a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> But I loved it. I loved singing those lines that yeah. he wrote. But when you started to then improvise over those chord changes, how was your process then? I mean, mm. how did you go about it? Because in a way, how how you did it, um, nobody had done it before, like like this, you know. So you really found a new way of, of doing this, I think. Uh, well, and also I think through these changes, it's uh, it's amazing what you did. Yeah, I mean, I didn't always... Um take solos I mean, a lot of sure, the time yeah. it's just just part of the ensemble sound um which i also like but i don't know it was just really using my ear listening to the way kenny improvised mm -hmm. and i mean I, i always thought in terms of melody mm. rather than oh this line will fit that chord i don't really know you know th this is the thing i find it really difficult to explain because Sometimes when I've been doing workshops and I take a piece like gentle piece, so you, you have like four bars of one chord, four bars of, or, you know, it goes on a 20 bar, a 20 bar piece, you know, which Kenny yeah. is a form that Kenny seemed to like a lot. Maybe um, because it fits on one piece of music paper. <laughs> I think that's 20 bars <laughs> because I think usually it's four, it's five yeah. systems, right? Isn't it? Yeah, uh, maybe so. I'm wrong, but I think now that that just came to mind. Thinking of the music, no, the first ten bars would be on one page, and then the next ten on the other page. Yeah. But um, I would say to students, well, you know, this is the chord. What does it sound like? Sing whatever you hear on that chord. Mm. Sing a scale, and eventually, if you sing up every next note, you eventually come to one that doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. And then, if you alter that, perhaps by a semitone up or down. It will fit. But you get the flow of that. It's like a ladder. Yeah. And you go up it. And then from there, suddenly you realize there's a note that fits to the chord that's coming, mm. the next chord, which I love, actually. I love finding a note that goes through all chords. Oh, you know? yeah. Sure. And I would experiment in that way. But I think also you have to be a bit daring. Mm -hmm. You know, you're prepared to be wrong. Yeah. Otherwise, if you're too careful, then <laughs> you don't really discover anything. That's um, very true. And I think playing with John was like that because he was incredibly daring, you know. Oh, yeah. He was just, it's a wildfire, really. Mm -hmm. And I loved that. He never knew what would happen. You know, it's, it's all ear, really, listening and, and following. And also assimilating the shape of the whole piece. 
So mm. you can hear where it's going. You know what's coming next. So you know where to go. Mm. You have to know that you're heading for the next sound. Yeah. I'm sorry, it's really difficult to describe. I mean, I think you already uh, described it. You know, uh, when I think about you singing over those changes, that's mm. how what it sounds like. You know, in a way, you're uh, pushing yourself, you're pushing the envelope. To me, it sounds like a paradox because uh, yeah. you're pushing and you're like, you're in the unknown, but you never sound stressed or you never sound like uh, too excited. So that when you sing a melody, it really is a melody, it's another melody, it's another part of the tune. You know, it sounds like composed in a way. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of the singable melodies, they don't take too many giant leaps, you know. Uh, your your melodies when you and not all of them, but when you improvise, it really sounds like the what you just talked about, like a semitone there. Maybe you go half step up, down, whatever. You know, uh, finding okay. finding the common notes. Yeah, totally yes. makes sense. But I do also like big jumps mm. in you know, like in some of Kenny's melodies. You know, the oh, big yeah. jumps, winter sweet. Mm -hmm. you know? song which I think is one of the loveliest that he wrote mm -hmm. you know I, I really love those those big Winter Sweet is a really really hard song to sing you know yeah. <laughs> well, so I'm told <laughs> it's amazing but you um, it doesn't sound hard when you when you sing it well I was drawn to it I loved it mm -hmm. from the beginning so when you really love something it's very easy to learn mm -hmm. you know? because you want to you're drawn to it you yeah, it was like Jimmy Roll's tune, you know, the peacocks. Oh, yeah. This place. I mean, the bridge to that is very difficult, but when you want to do it, you you know, you just work at it until you get it right, and then it's suddenly. Yeah. It's never easy, I have to say. Depends who you're singing it with. That that piece. Yeah. It depends what, which chords are being played, because if somebody somebody plays a wrong note sometimes in a chord, mm. then you're completely. So, yeah, <laughs> I recently had a dis di discovery uh, with that tune. It's another paradox. Um, those, those, the melody in the bridge, the those tones that sound so out but still yeah. yet so inside. Yes. If you play the chords and then transpose them to the tritone, mm -hmm. they're completely inside. So if you if you sing that melody and the pianist goes. It loses the effect of obviously, but the yeah. pianist goes instead of E flat half diminished A flat seven going to D flat minor. So if if a pianist plays A minor D seven going to D flat minor, the the notes sound exactly right, and yeah. it seems to be that where where his um, his idea came from. That's my theory at least. <laughs> but I understand if a pianist goes do something completely different, it's hard to find those notes. I guess. Yes. Yeah. Because I never think of them in terms of the intervals that they are. Mm -hmm. What I do just, you think of them? I just hear where I'm going. Mm -hmm. no, I don't know. I just I just hear it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I've just learnt it, and I know that that's where I have to go. Yeah. But of course. I've forgotten now even what those intervals are. I did work out what they were yeah. as help to, to, to try and get it right. But once I got it right enough times, it's like I threw the paper away. And yeah. I, I could manage without. Mm. But it does depend on somebody playing something that makes sense behind me. I mean, yeah. usually I can keep my own place if whatever's going on. But with that tune, it's really hard. Yeah, um, yeah. How was it to finally get to play with him? And Jimmy then, Rose. yeah, and then also this tune, you know, how can you describe what it felt like and also what your process was for hiring him for your record and then how it felt to play with him? Well, the thing is, I I first heard Bill Evans play this tune and fell in love with it and thought, I want to write words to that. So I started to try to, to think of what I could write. I started and I didn't finish it. And eventually I had the offer of a broadcast in Hamburg, you know, with the NDR Symphony Orchestra. And I had to find someone to do something like 10 arrangements. And I asked this wonderful, wonderful writer who unfortunately now died called Steve Gray. 
Oh, yeah. And I was thinking of beautiful things that I could do with an orchestra. And I thought, wow, there's that lovely tune, you know, the peacocks. And I mentioned it, and Steve knew it. And he said, well, yeah, but I have to have the words. Before I do the arrangement, I need the words. Mm. That's how he was. That's the kind of mm -hmm. person and, and musician that he was. He knew words, like Jimmy did. Mm. Um, Jimmy Rolls knew the words to everything. Yeah. He played. Anyway, so I thought, I thought oh, I better finish these. So I finished them and sent them. We, did, we did the broadcast. And so I had a recording of this. I thought, oh, maybe I'll send it to him, to Jimmy. Mm -hmm. because I, I had an address for him. Mm -hmm. so I just, it was a cassette. I put the cassette in the envelope, wrote this letter, sent it off and heard nothing for months. And eventually my then partner said, well, you, you, you've got to chase this up. You've got to find out. And I said, no, he, he obviously didn't like it. Otherwise he would have, you know, he would have said something because my address was on the back, all details in the, in the letter, you know, he could have rung if he liked it. So he said, no, you have to, you know, you've got to try. So he dialed the number. <laughs> Uh, wow. And it, was, and it was about midnight and this woman answered and and said, uh, I said, can I speak to Mr. Rolls, please? Uh-oh. Oh, she said, are you sleeping right now? I said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so no, no, it's okay. She said, we're getting kind of old over here. <laughs> said, ring back in an hour. So I rang back in an hour. Hello. Oh, this is this his voice. Hello. Oh. And I said, um, Mr. Rolls, I said, I, I wrote some words to a piece of yours called The Peacocks. I, I sent them. I, I don't know whether you ever got them. He said, I didn't get them. He said, I've been ill. I've been ill, so somebody probably threw them away. I said, oh, I'm so send them again. Mm -hmm. send them again, he said. But I have to tell you, somebody's already written some words. I said, oh, well, then I won't bother. No, 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 send me yours. I want to hear them. So I sent him this version with the orchestra. And, and I was in, I remember I was in Sweden in a hotel and I got this message, please ring Jimmy Rolls. Wow. Uh, cost a fortune from a hotel in, <laughs> in Sweden. And he said, I love them. I love these words. You know, I love them. He said, but I don't know what to do because there are these other words. Anyway, he said, so you can't record them. So I just mm. said, oh, anyway, it's very nice that you like them. Um, so months went by, and I suddenly had a call, and he said, okay. I got into J Johnny Mercer's lawyer, and he said, what you have to do is you change the title of the piece and re-register it as another piece. He said, so if we change the title, re-register it, then you can record it. Who, do you, who are you going to record it with? And I said, I don't know. I don't have any idea. I, um, I don't have a plan, you know. I said, how about you? He said, oh, me, I've been ill. I, I don't know whether I can do it. Yeah. Anyway, that was that went on. So we registered it as a timeless place. Mm. Unfortunately, still some people record it and call it the peacocks, which means I don't get any royalties, but <laughs> never mind. So I tried. I was going to do something in Banff teaching, and there was a studio there and an engineer. So we tried to get Jimmy to come to Banff. You know, he was living in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. But then he suddenly called me and said, look, I, I feel quite despondent, but I can't do it because my doctor said I, I mustn't fly. Mm. I had emphysema. And um, he had said he needed oxygen cylinders yeah. and tubes going up his nose. And, and he seemed really disappointed. So I said, well, don't worry. We'll come to Los Angeles. I said. <laughs> <laughs> so we then had to find a studio um, I booked um, Joe La Barbara, who mm -hmm. lived there, and I, I'd met doing something with Kenny some time earlier. And um, I said to Jimmy about the bass player. Oh, he said, I'd like to use Bounce, he used to call him. That was a George Moraz. Mm. I didn't know George, and I rang George, and he was reluctant, asking for a lot of money because he didn't know me. Mm. I said, well, I can pay you so much and then so much more when I sell the record but not what you're asking for. But then he said, yeah, I want to play with the old man again because they used to play, ah. he and we used to play together at uh, Bradley's, I think. Or, mm -hmm. Anyway, they played together a lot. So that happened. So there were airfares from England, hotels. You know, I borrowed money to do it. Mm. But uh, 
I got there and I met Jimmy and he was so lovely, mm -hmm. but ill. I didn't realize how ill he was. You know, he had to have these oxygen cylinders wherever he went. Also, the recording, George Moraes turned up and had the flu. Oh. And Jimmy said, I can't go into a studio with, if I catch anything, I, I could die. So, oh, shit. So, wow. <laughs> oh, no. So, he, said, he then said, I've spoken to my doctor, and if we wear masks, me and uh, George, I can do it. <laughs> so we got these surgical masks, and so we got through, I think, eight pieces, and then he said, I can do one more. The thing is with him, I found the first thing we recorded was Where or When. Mm. Um, and I had chosen pieces, actually, that I thought would suit him. Mm. And I let him choose some things because I did suggest Winter Sweet. Mm. And I, I sent it to him and he said, oh, that's too modern for me. I mean, <laughs> having written the bridge of, uh, yeah, sure. of the Peacocks, yeah. Winter Sweet was too modern. He said, no, I, I can't play it like those guys, you know. Mm. Which, so I... I let him suggest some pieces, and of course he knew all the words to everything, so it worked. He suggested um, quite a lot of pieces we did. I remember I sang the verse to Where or When, it was the first thing we did, and then, which was out of tempo, yeah. and then it went into a tempo, and he said, and I found I was smiling because the tempo was so right. Yeah. I think he always talked about that being in the pocket. You know, mm. I think tempos had to be like this. And I loved it because he played the whole of the piano, not just the middle. I mean, oh, yeah. Acton, you know, played the lower end of the piano as well. Mm. That was a, an absolute experience, you know, with all the business of getting the money together. Oh, and then yeah. At the last minute, thinking it was going to be cancelled. I mean, I did Joy Spring with just bass and drums. I wasn't going to do that one at all, but because Jimmy couldn't play anymore, I thought, what can we do? Just bass and drums. So we did that one mm. and did just the duo with George and that tune, Cy Coleman tune, It Amazes Me, mm. which he'd never seen before. Just put the music on the stand and he just made it absolutely incredible. And um, there were people knocking at the door to come in for the next session. So it was really fraught. Wow. It was, <laughs> it was on a knife edge. <laughs> mm -hmm. Old thing. Also, it doesn't sound like that at all when, when you listen to the record. It's yeah. a beautiful record. And yeah. uh, wow. And also nice, you, you said where or when was the first tune you re recorded? Yeah. And that's yeah. the first tune on the record. It's on the record, yeah. 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 So we're actually experiencing it as, as you did. It's, yes, it's, I mean, I don't know about the rest of them, but uh, mm -hmm. I remember that was the first one we recorded. Mm -hmm. You touched a little bit on that before, but you've played with so many great piano players, one of them being my teacher, JT. I wonder what you wish from a piano player or an accompanist. What do you expect from somebody and uh, what do you like about somebody? Well, I never really think of it as being accompanied. I don't like the idea of being accompanied. Because it puts me in the situation where I am calling the shots or something and I expect certain things. I always think of it as a dialogue. You know, I, I would always prefer to play something which the musicians I'm with like to play rather than say, oh, well, I want to play this. Mm. And they're thinking. Mm -hmm. It's a very unconventional approach for a singer. I, well, I don't know. Of course, I have favorite things that I want to do. And, mm -hmm. uh, but... I always find that I'm not happy if, if if I feel whoever I'm singing with is not really into it, you know. Mm. Uh, I mean, singing with John was not like singing with anybody else because he would make no allowances. I could say to him, oh, I need a note for this to start this, mm -hmm. but that hardly ever happened because often he would improvise and then I would come in. Mm -hmm. some, or, and sometimes it might be a wrong note. But it wouldn't matter because I would then improvise until we got to a place where we recognized yeah. where I recognized which key we were in. I remember once we did a thing at Middlesex University and the students paid for me and John to come and do a concert and then they asked questions and one of them said, How do you rehearse? And we said, Well we we don't really, we just you know, obviously if there's a piece John had to learn, like we do a thing like Strange Meadow Lark, you know, that mm. Dave Rubeck tune. Well, that's a difficult tune. Yeah. 
And so your version is so personal, you know, with the uh, with that intro. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it's lovely. It's, um, but you know, obviously, John would have to work on that, mm -hmm. and it's a difficult song. So we work individually, you know, mm -hmm. learning your bit. But when we came together, you know, we just play. We didn't really rehearse. Even with Azimuth, we would get together at Kenny's house sometimes, and we'd play a bit. You know, we'd say, "Oh, we're going to do this," but we never worked out exactly what we were going to do. Mm. You know, who was going to solo then, or whatever? It just, I don't know. It just seemed to work. At least that's my memory of it. I'm just having cups of tea and <laughs> and, and playing. Mm. Um, and anyway. We said, well, we don't, to this student, we don't really, really rehearse. And he said, well, do you have to do anything, you know, for instance, to give Norma a note or to help or at any point? And John said, no. I, he said, I never think about it. He said, I, I just assume that she's going to know, <laughs> going to know mm -hmm. what, where we are. Um, and so it was not a thing that was ever really discussed. Because in a way, we, we, you know, we had worked a lot together from the standards up, you know, to to doing. He was started to write music, and then we met Kenny, and then Kenny was involved with John's music, and, my, and everything seemed to evolve. Yeah. So, but that's not answering your question about what I expect. So, what I got from John was just an experience of of hearing what he was doing, and I mean, his time, as you know, was just absolutely phenomenal. I think mm -hmm. I never met anybody. Who could seem to play in two different time signatures at the same time? But that was really hard mm. some, for me with you know azimuth pieces. Yeah. But um, gradually, as we played them, I'd get more familiar and know what to do. But um, from other pianists, I suppose I I always hope for some kind of daring from them. I hope yeah. that they're going to be playing as if I was another instrument they were playing with. You know. People often ask me this. They say, well, what do you expect? Because recently I, I was doing something for the National Youth Jazz Collective, mm -hmm. and I spent half an hour with the young pianists that were on the course, each each one. I think some sometimes they, was, they would say, well, well, what do you want me to do? How? And just play. I said, just play <laughs> the piece. And we'll do this piece. You just play and mm. listen to what I'm doing and do what you think. Mm. It's experience, really. Um, I don't expect you to be really quiet and in the background. I expect you to enjoy playing the piece. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. Obviously, if you've got any sense and any ears, you're not going to sort of thunder on the piano if I'm singing something quietly. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's just... And I always remember people saying, oh, so-and-so is a great accompanist because they play beautiful chords. But for me, also, a, a very important thing is time. Mm. You could play a wrong chord. But if it's if you play something rhythmically interesting mm. and in time, in the time that I'm in, yeah. uh, I would then be happier than you playing absolutely all the right chords but be hesitant and just... Yeah. You know, not having that flow of, of time. Mm. Someone said to me once, if you try and count through the bars in somewhere called home, it's not really in time. And a lot of it moves in a way more like classical music in that it has a breath. So, yeah, breath. Yeah. Um, whoever you're playing with has to have the same sort of idea of time. You know, everybody's mm. idea of time is a bit different. You have to have the same time. So you can sort of breathe together. Mm. What I, I want is somebody who plays what they want to play, listening to me and just trying to make something happen. Mm. That's really beautiful. Yeah. You always turned your back on, uh, you know, that glamorous singer in the in the spotlight with the band behind it. Where does it come from that you don't care as much as other think, singers about that? Where Where does it come from? I think it was shyness in the first place. I was so shy and nervous. That I would rather not have been seen. You but know, it I comes did. it comes across as being not shy at all, but very confident, you know? Well, it is now. <laughs> I think when I started, I was so nervous. Mm. You couldn't believe it. I used to come up in red patches on my arms and my neck with nerves. And yeah. As soon as I was finished, I would run into the toilet and stay in there until I calmed down because I felt <laughs> if anybody came and touched me, I would hit the ceiling, you mm -hmm. know, my voice would shake and my heart would like this. And 
I'd be really nervous. I didn't really have much in the way of vocal training, but one thing I did have was uh, breathing, mm. breathing and producing the voice. And thinking about breathing and breathing correctly does help slow things down a bit. And if you have that to think about, then you you don't so much think about the fact that people are looking at you. This was the, the thing I hated, the fact I was standing there, I didn't know what to do, and people were watching. Mm. In fact, I mean, Michael Garrett said to me at one time, he said, it used to be painful to watch you in the beginning. It's painful <laughs> because you were so nervous. Um, <laughs> But I don't know when it changed. I mean, I still get nervous, but now I can enjoy more being in front of an audience. I mean, it took years before I could say a word. Mm. I practice. I say, good evening. <laughs> so, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to introduce the band. <laughs> and when it came to it, I couldn't say anything. Mm. It was like words stopped there. I don't know when it changed, but... I suppose when I got more confident about what I was doing, and I also I think things changed a lot for me when we recorded for ECM. I suddenly heard my voice recorded in a way that it had never been recorded before mm. because I hated my voice. I really hated the sound of it. And I used to think, I don't know why some people like it even. I, I can't imagine why they like it because I don't like it. But suddenly... When we did the, the first Azimuth album, I heard the recordings back and I thought, wow, I actually sound all right. Mm -hmm. I can listen to this. So it was partly the music and the space in the music and my place in the music somehow seemed right. And then I aimed for that sound. Mm -hmm. Sound changed, I think, after that. It got bigger. And also the, the experience of working with Kenny, I think, made a big difference to the way I made the sound. Mm-hmm influenced by his sound I think yeah and the way he played a melody as well mm -hmm. so I started to think more about that than about really the notes I was singing or whether to improvise because when I first started I was just mad about improvising when I discovered singing without words you know really that was it I wanted to do that it didn't really matter what it sounded like I just needed to get the right notes mm -hmm on the chord or whatever it was. And I think I forgot about the fact that you have to sound lovely as well, you know, if, if you want people to listen to you. But I think all this is just a real learning process. And then I got to a point where I could bear to listen to myself. And I think that helped me with the confidence of, of what I was performing to people mm. on stage. Before then, I guess I'd never really been sure. And I was always thinking, oh, they probably hate this, you know. Mm. And, uh, I, I don't really like it. I love doing it, but I'm thinking what's going out there I probably wouldn't like to listen to. Because mm. I always think of that with free music. When I was doing free, free music, I thought, well, this is great fun to do, but I don't know if I'd want to listen to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a great experience doing it, though. You mm -hmm. know, so you had to think of your own, what you were putting into the music yourself. You know, So it was not like anything you'd learnt. It was just something you were thinking of to add to what everybody else was doing. Yeah. I loved. But I guess in a way, I don't really think that I'm that good on stage, you know. I, I don't know. I mean, I, of course, I, I, I love performing. I, I do love singing to audiences. I love the feeling that they are perhaps getting what I'm doing. Hmm. I don't think they always do, but... Um, <laughs> I love singing songs now. For a long time, I was more into wordless stuff. and But really, I always loved words, and I mm. always loved singing words, and I still do. And I went off and discovered different things to sing, you know, like when we did Somewhere Called Home, and I wrote words to Sea Lady and Cafe, you know, things which were not songs, but they became songs. Celeste, also. Celeste, yes, yeah, of course. Mm. Um, when I started to do that, I then seemed to come back more to singing songs and not quite improvising quite so much. Mm. Because I think improvising with a voice is quite difficult, really. I mean, I never learnt the bebop way. and I mean, I do it sometimes, but I mean, there are people who are a lot better at that than I am, you know. There's mm. a singer over here called Anita Wardell who, she, you know, she scats through bebop stuff, like, incredibly. Mm. And I, I don't really do that. I like to listen to it, but it never really suited me so well as the more modal things, you know. Um, I mean, there are tons of chords in there too, you know. 
I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If you sing over, you know, song for a child or something like that, there's a lot of moving around there. So on edge of time. Oh, ah, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's hard yeah. to sing over that tune, you know. Yes. I don't yeah. know if I want to listen to Anita O'Day sing over that. <laughs> <laughs> and I have nothing against Anita O'Day, but, I, you I know. Love. Yeah, and I know what you mean. It's a different approach, you know. It's yeah. your background anyway. I mean. But the overall... Uh, approach is the same i mean finding the right notes and finding yeah. the common notes and where you approach those yeah. common notes that's what we all do you know yeah it's just finding different outlets for that or yes. uh, yeah but i, I want to know everything about somewhere <laughs> called home oh, that's my favorite well. record of yours and i always go back to that record and i think it's just beautiful Uh, what you've created there and also the in there's a interplay and your uh, way you move with those guys yes that's like a string quartet or a string trio whatever it's you've you've said it before it moves yeah it well, really came about because uh, we had done maybe two albums with azimuth and um, i wanted to do an album with some other things on it, with some songs, you know. Mm. So I asked Manfred Eicher, I, I, at least I said to him, look, I, I want to do an album with different things on it, which I think you perhaps won't like. So I may have to do it with somebody else, another record label. And he said, why? What do you think I wouldn't like? <laughs> I said, well, I mean, there's some, maybe some standards. Or... And he said, well, what, what do you, th who do you think of doing it this with? And I said, well, John, of course. Um, I said, well, I thought perhaps we just invite different guests, and different pieces. He said, well, who, for instance? And I just came up with a list of people, one of whom was Tony Coe. Mm. And when I got to Tony Coe, he said, I want to record him. <laughs> I want to record Tony Coe. Um, yes, just do it with you, John, and Tony Coe, which seemed a bit strange because of azimuth, you know, but... Mm -hmm, I see. Anyway, I don't know. We knew Tony very well. I love Tony's playing. Mm. He's so special, yeah. Um, so we did. We just came up with uh, some pieces. I just heard Sea Lady and uh, wrote some words to that. Although the funny thing is that the words I wrote were um, <laughs> not to the what Kenny thought was the melody. There's a count, what I thought yeah, was Yeah, yeah, right. Ba, ba, de, da, was it? Yeah. Da, 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 da. But when I heard it, I hadn't seen it written down. Yeah. I just heard John recorded it with Stan Saltzman. Mm -hmm. Stan, okay. And um, I listened to it, and what came out for me it was there's an arpeggio. Ba, bo, be, da, do, do, de, do, de. Ba, yeah. ba, bo, ba, ba, do, do, de. Bo, yeah. Well, those notes came out. I thought, oh, that's a two. Da, do, 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 de. Do, 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 do. Yeah. So I wrote words to that. I sent them to Ken, and he said, "Where's my melody?" <laughs> he said, "I can't, I can't make these words fit." So I said, "Why not?" I said, "Look, it's waking on the shore. Yeah. To find the sand is cold. Yeah, but that's not the melody." <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I said, "What's the melody then?" He said, "You know, ba da dee da." I said, "Oh." Yeah, but no, I'm not, not going to sing that, aren't I? No. He said, oh, okay. He said, well, <laughs> he said, he made some funny remark about writing words to things he hadn't written, you know. Yeah. But uh, anyway, we recorded it, and that has become the melody. Mm -hmm. and, Very true. Uh, I mean, so, JT added the, the real melody yes, on top. Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. But he has to play that. It's written in yeah. those arpeggios underneath, you know, what I'm singing. And, and that they stick out, those notes, you know. Ba, do, 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 ding, mm -hmm. ding, do, 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 ding. That just seemed obvious to me. That that yeah. was but, um, it's the most singable part of the song. It is, way. of course, yes. Yeah, so it would be, wouldn't it, for me? Yeah, and often Kenny wrote counter melodies for things anyway. So, yeah, he's a master um, of that. Yeah. Anyway, so that, that was I thought, well, that, and I'm going to find these in cafe. I'd heard cafe and mm. thought that could be a beautiful song. Yes. Did you hear, hear it on Egberto's uh, own yeah. record? Sold yeah. a deal with, um, with uh, Jan Garbarek and Ralph. Oh, that's the first oh. version you've heard? That's the first version I heard, yes. Okay, because I, 
I was trying to transcribe the song and so I was looking into finding different versions of it and I basically he did a very crazy version uh, with Brazilian musicians I think oh, really? on some maybe one of his first records um, and I thought wow Norma has heard that <laughs> and then she went on to doing it this way <laughs> I'll no. I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you. You you, you let me know what you think. Yeah. But uh, it's music version that I I worked from. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Um, because that is wow. That that's amazing. How she, <laughs> how, no, where she took that song, but it's still version. amazing. You know. So there was that, and Celeste had already written those words, and that was funny because uh, we were on tour, I think, with Azimuth opposite uh, uh, Ralph Towner. And Abercrombie. And, uh, Abercrombie, yeah. yeah. And while we were on tour, I wrote these words and I, I showed them to Ralph and he said, yeah, I said, but then they're good. He said, but I was thinking of writing words myself. Oh. I said, oh, okay. Um, well, okay. I said, well, can I sing these until you write yours? <laughs> he said, yeah, of course. Anyway, he never did write any. Sure, so yeah. To record, I thought, well, I'm going to record these anyway. Yeah. And, uh, so that's it. <laughs> um, and he, I think he was happy yeah. with them in the end. And there were some things like Out of This World. Oh, yeah. Well, that was a song that I always sang, only very differently from, you know, I, I first heard Coltrane playing it. That's what my theory was. You really? Know. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> because I somehow I can hear Coltrane in your version. Really? Wow. I somehow can hear it. Yeah, oh, I love that that thing. A fantastic version he did. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I then found it, you know, it was a song, Harold Arlen's yeah. song, and began to sing it, and he, I mean, more like the Coltrane version. But then when we got to doing this recording, I wanted to sing it, but I think we suddenly thought, I don't think Manfred's going to really like the way we were doing it. So overnight, I think John wrote this 12 tone row yeah and tony loves that kind of thing because he played a lot of um of music you know sort of he was really into into webern and schoenberg mm. and this kind of music you know he loved it he loved the idea of having a line like that to play and so he played that and uh, then just i was just saying you're clear out of this world over that you know without the chords and then, of course, you get to the bridge, and what are you going to do? So yeah. you thought, okay, we're going to the bridge as it is. Mm. But somehow that just made it a different piece, mm -hmm. you know, having that sort of atonal thing at the beginning behind the melody. So that was that. And we'd, I don't know, we're a high, lily, high, low. I, I, it was a thing I always loved. And, of course, Bill Evans played that too, also some time ago. Oh, yeah. Um, with that step up, la, be, da, do, 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 do. Mm. do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was nice. Oops. Obviously, John did that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we, we just got to the end, and more or less, and Manfred said, well, do you have anything else? And I said, well, we do have a standard, but I said, I'm sure you won't like it. It's, he said, what is it? He said, it's got tea for two. And he said, well, let me hear it. it of course, it had been altered mm -hmm. because another musician Bob Cornford had reharmonized the piece for an arrangement that he did mm. and, um, so we took those those chords and you know you slow it right down and it just it was just a beautiful piece I know sometimes people have said to me how can you sing those words because they're a bit cheesy in a way I said well you just have to believe you know think of it as it's in a way a sad, sad song, really. Just thinking, you know, we will raise a family, a girl for you, a boy for me. Yeah. Can't see how happy we could be. Mm. Could, probably won't be, but could be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and if you get yourself into that way of thinking of it, then you can make it into a sad song. Yeah. Or an honest connection to those lyrics. Mm. That's interesting, finding a way through only one word that can change the meaning for you. Yeah, thanks for sharing those memories. Yeah, it was a very, very special time. Yeah. And maybe you can name some, some other singers um, when you were coming up that really interested you. You've already mentioned Sinatra as a, as a big influence. And uh, Lena Horne, just because I was so stunned by her, 
how beautiful she was and, and her breath control, incredible mm. breath control and sort of animal thing she had. I loved Karma McRae. She was a big favourite of mine. Mm -hmm. Of course, I liked all of uh, But Ella was such an influence. Yeah. Uh, I discovered a, a first broadcast that I'd ever done in 1967. Yeah, and I, I can hear Ella. You know, yeah. It was uh, her influence. She was so joyful and just you hear all the love of the music that she had. Mm. And she's singing. And I loved her. And then I, I was more interested in instrumentalists than singers for a while, you know, Miles and Coltrane and uh, then Bill Evans. Dave Brubeck was, I, I loved that quartet mm -hmm. with Paul Desmond, Jazz Impressions of the USA. That was a real eye opener for, or ear opener for me because I didn't know they were improvising because Paul Desmond plays such great lines. Yeah. That you think they were written. And so I learned them. And oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I felt that they were improvising. But um, yeah, I've always, I always liked Brubeck's. Mm. And then someone said, oh, you know, if you like Brubeck, no, you should listen to. Thelonious Monk, which of course I then did, yeah. the Modern Jazz Quartet. And yeah. For singers, and of course, Anitro Day, I heard on the Jazz on a Summer's Day. Yeah. Sing out fast. Yeah. <laughs> Big hat. No, yeah, I, like, I liked her, I found her interesting. Um, I mean, there's singers that I really like, you know, like Diane Reeves, she's a great singer. But then Shirley Horn, oh. I mean, Shirley Horn was yeah. a killer yeah. singer. Absolutely. She's so beautiful. Yeah. Incredibly beautiful pianist. Oh, yeah. Well, as a singer. Yeah. And of course, then Joni Mitchell, of course. Sure. Yeah. I, love Joni. I like Randy Newman. I love Randy Newman. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's, He's special. Very deep. Mm hmm. How about Peggy Lee? Yeah, I liked Peggy Lee, but I, I just found it sort of really nice, pleasant listening. Yeah. But it didn't touch me, you know, in the way that, say, that Sinatra and Ella did. Sure, yeah. Now, there's a couple of songs of her that really, not everything, but I also really like the, how clear she sings, you know, that oh, there's nothing, yes. there's, there's oh. no wasted note or no, uh, nothing, like, there's this common uh, disease You know, not only with singers, but also with instrumentalists too, but that need to uh, do a variation on the melody. Yeah. You know? And I think... Um, I she... used to be... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was going to say that you're an example of somebody who's not doing it. Some people do it out of insecurity as a means to put their stamp on the music because they feel they have to do that, you yes. know? Yeah. And... You don't, you only do it because of the music, you know, you're only doing it, you never hear a thought process, it's just natural how it, the melody evolves in an, maybe another way, but then comes back to the, you know, and, and it goes back to what I said be before, that, that everything you sing is so crystal clear, there's nothing that gets in, gets in the way, you know. Thank you. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know, I mean, I just do what I do, and uh I mean, I do respect a good melody. You know? mm. And there isn't always a need to change things. I think I used to think there was in, in the early days. Mm. I thought that was what you did to mm -hmm. be a jazz singer. You know, you had to do something different <laughs> mm -hmm. with the melody. And maybe because of doing wordless stuff a lot more, I found that the outlet in that, rather than in playing around with the with a song yeah. so much, Okay, uh, Norma, I, I want to thank you so much for, for doing this. Uh, it has been a great pleasure to, to talk you. to you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. <laughs> I haven't talked too much. I tend to... Oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. That's what I was looking for. You can hear you seem to have got very well the kind of process of, you know, what, I'm, what I've done, what I'm doing. Um, and I just think... I was just greatly blessed by being around at the same time <laughs> as people like uh, Kenny and John mm. and, um, and having the opportunity to to play their music, and uh, which seemed to be just what I was looking for. Mm. Very lucky, I think. Mm -hmm. 
-huh. When you think of those guys now, where, where do you see them? What do you mean? I don't know. What, where do I see them? Yeah, you I, know, if if John comes to mind, if Kenny comes to mind, how do you remember them? What's you know, what's your go-to memory? Oh, I'm know. sure there are plenty. You know, there are lots. There are lots, and I still miss them. I'm very, you know, upset yeah. thinking that they're not here. Um, yeah. I don't know. Just remember lots of funny things, you know, with Kenny. He was very funny. Oh, yeah. Very funny person. But, um, uh, yeah, in a very quiet way. Um, mm. And so, I, you know, I I miss those things. I, I don't know. I mean, immediately what I think is it's very sad that we won't, yeah. won't be any more. Um, but there's still things that 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 they both did that I haven't heard yet. Mm -hmm. I'm still discovering, and uh, and in fact, you know, John and I had two sons. And yeah. We were married to men, um, and uh, they were clearing out stuff, and they brought round here to me a box with all kinds of recordings. <sighs> Wow. And things which real to real things. So, so there is probably a lot of things there I never heard. Mm. I've re rediscovered some, like the first ever Azimuth broadcast. Wow. You know, so there's, there's still lots of things that I haven't heard, I'm sure, mm. that I'm going to be discovering. In the last two days, I've been going back to a lot of stuff from you with, with those guys. Mm. And They're gone, but they're so alive on those recordings, oh, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it really, they keep on giving. They keep on giving. And it's so, so special. It's so, so great that we have, um, we have this, this medium of music yes. that can, they're not gone. They're there. And I think it was so great, really, that Manfred Eicher was... <laughs> was and is around yes you know to capture and to shape some of that stuff i mean he's mm -hmm. responsible for the fact that azimuth existed mm -hmm. you know john went to him with a, a duo tape that we, he and i had made and he liked it and then john put on um some, a synthy he just got this synthy aks and he was playing around with it and he came up with a loop and he said Put the microphone in. It's just said, "Oh, improvise over that." So I did, and he played that to Manfred, and Manfred immediately said he could hear the flugel with the voice, and mm. said, "Why don't we make an album with just the three of you?" Yeah, and that piece, we didn't have a title for it, and even after we recorded, we didn't have a title for it, and. Um, Manfred said, well, when, when you decide on the title, let me know. He said, it sounds like a kind of piece of direction or something. So we came home. John looked in the thesaurus under different words. Direction was one. And he came to the word azimuth. So he said, oh, and an azimuth, it's a ring which you get on ships, I think, an instrument for determining direction. Mm -hmm. And it means the, the arc from the zenith to the horizon. Mm -hmm. And... So, well, that's a lovely word. So he said, oh, we'll call the piece Asm. And Manfred said, let's call the album Asm. Let's call the group Asm. Mm -hmm. But he brought the three of us. I mean, we knew Kenny, of course. We'd been working with him. Sure. It was his idea that that should be the group that mm. John would record with. Beautiful. And uh, he's been so responsible for... The whole movement, I think, of mm -hmm. music, as you, as you know. Mm. <laughs> But, um, yeah, you, you guys really broke new ground with that music. Nothing like that has ever been heard before or since. No, you know, I, and, um, it was a bit uh, too early, really. You know, I well, think it, it didn't get the acceptance in England that it should have done. But, mm. you know, that's how it is. But, but it seems to still... In 
influence young musicians when they hear it. You know, mm. Still, everybody I, needs to hear this. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but, that's the box everybody should get. Yeah. It shocks me yeah. sometimes when this I want this <laughs> because I, I have this one. <laughs> So, this one too one. <laughs> we could go on <laughs> forever yeah but uh, I, I'm surprised sometimes when I listen at the brilliance of Kenny's sound and the kind of that sort of airiness that it has everything has yeah very proud to have been involved with that really mm. yeah. and we're yeah. all thankful <laughs> we're all thankful Thank you. Well, I want to hear you now. I want to hear you. Well, I'll make sure you, you'll get something. Okay? Okay, Pablo. Thanks Goodbye. so much. Goodbye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Little meadow lark, meadow lark, singing so sweetly, so strangely in the dark. How the shadows fall over all, singing so sweetly, so strangely.